is a little bit broad, uh, but there will be uh, this order, and uh, generally uh, quantum phases uh, with uh, singlets, valence bonds, giving us the building blocks of entanglement in quantum magnets. Uh, and uh, thinking about this order, uh, let me kind of think of the types of this order uh, we often get in magnetic materials. This is quench disorder uh, into these three categories. Okay, so we can have magnetic disorder. So that can be magnetic impurities, or since we already have a spin model, uh, if I have some dilution, if I substitute a non-magnetic site for a magnetic site, I'm removing a spin, uh, that's a kind of magnetic disorder. It's a disorder on the sites of our magnet. Okay, so that's one. Two, we can also have non-magnetic disorder. Uh, so that's bond randomness or energy randomness. It comes in the couplings of the spins. We can get it just by putting charge disorder, anything that you do to the non-magnetic sites uh, uh, or um, uh, yeah, electric fields. Okay, and even then there's kind of two limits. Uh, there's some materials, uh, you can call them alloys, uh, like the ytterbium magnesium gallium oxide. Uh, it, as long as you preserve triangular lattice symmetry and the magnesium and gallium share one of these triangular lattice sites, they're gonna be disordered, they're charged, not they don't carry spin, so that's like a disordered Ising model on the triangular lattice of charge. Uh, as long as you preserve the symmetry, intrinsically you have disorder. It's not some defect concentration. So that's uh, uh, the kind of alloy limit. You can also have just weak randomness, giving me this bond randomness. Uh, I think of uh, 1 TTS2 where it looks like uh, we have evidence for disorder, probably coming from defects in the charge density wave that creates uh, the magnetic uh, uh, structure, uh, and those defects can occur at some smaller density, that's some weaker disorder. Okay, but that's all non-magnetic bond randomness disorder, and I'll also talk about a kind of subcategory of this, uh, thinking of crystalline defect, so it's non-magnetic, and in particular, some kind of topological defects in the crystal. This location, I'll show some even simpler example for domain walls. And why would we want to talk about this? Well, we can have in mind 3D weak topological insulators where we know dislocation lines carry gapless modes, uh, give you something very interesting. Uh, okay, uh, not as obvious what they'll do in magnets, but I'll argue for something interesting here. So in the talk today, uh, I'll focus on uh, two and three, uh, skip this kind of harder hammer of uh, magnetic defects. Uh, and actually, uh, I'll allow myself just an aside before I go into all this disorder, just uh, for uh, one and a half slides uh, uh, to uh, match the transport subtitle of the conference, talk about some electrical transports uh, in this magnet. Okay, so let me just flash uh, very quickly. Uh, to advertise it, really, uh, this uh, 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 from two different groups, uh, resistivity uh, as a function of temperature for different magnetic fields. These are the different curves. Okay, and you can see some magnetic insulator at zero field, 10 to the 7 uh, uh, centimeter. Uh, uh, and uh, as you apply a magnetic field of a few Tesla already, the resistivity drops by 100 million or something like that. Okay, from two different uh, groups, uh, two different crystals. So huge uh, colossal magnetoresistance. To me, it looks huge uh, in this uh, uh, magnetic insulator. And it's also anisotropic. Uh, uh, so you need to be applying the field along the C-axis uh, of this uh, complicated uh, crystal structure to get the huge drop in resistivity. You can see if you apply it along the AB plane doesn't drop that much, okay? And uh, it's anisotropic. Uh, we can look at magnetization. Magnetization is also anisotropic, but the magnetization anisotropy is opposite the CMR anisotropy. Okay, so let's look at this uh, uh, in detail. Okay, and, and this is magnetic, and you can imagine it should be. There's been five halves on the uh, manganese. Uh, okay, so this is a, the C-axis in blue magnetization. C-axis is the hard axis. AB plane is the easy axis. There is magnetic order, and it's very complicated, very magnetic, uh, not along C or AB. Uh, it's just a complicated um, uh, non-collinear structure. Uh, but this is the magnetization. So one way to interpret this is imagine sitting at like five Tesla, some field here, okay, and rotating the magnetic field from the B axis, from the AB plane to the C axis. So when it's in the AB plane, the spins are already polarized, but there's not really much CMR. The resistivity dropped by 10 or 100. 
But now you rotate the field to the c-axis, the magnetization now is clearly not at all saturated, not at all polarized, the spins are strongly fluctuating, but that's when you get this huge 10 to the 8 drop in resistivity. So there's a huge CMR. For the magnetic hard axis, it's not that polarizing the spins drops the resistivity, it's exactly the other way around. Okay, so that's kind of shocking. Uh, and uh, I'll just uh, kind of flash the advertisement for what uh, might be, what we propose might be a starting point for interpreting this, and we rely on two other hints, uh, which I'm not showing in detail, but the CMR is largest for the AB plane resistivity, always needs a C-axis field, but AB plane resistivity is what, is what especially drops, and also there's a pretty big magnetostriction, uh, like uh, uh, AB plane changes by 10 to the minus 4 when you apply this uh, couple Tesla field, and you need the C-axis field to change the AB plane. So what's going to couple AB plane resistivity or lattice to your C-axis? And you can imagine chiral orbital currents giving a small contribution to the magnetization that's uh, overwhelmed by the spin, uh, but uh, how they respond uh, and maybe align some pattern uh, of these chiral orbital currents uh, in the AB plane, how they respond to the C-axis magnetization can greatly uh, change uh, rho AB. Uh, so this is a figure that uh, my student Sami Hakani, who's here uh, on the, in the audience, uh, drew as part of a symmetry analysis to show this needs to occur tellurium tellurium bond. Okay, so this was a very quick advertisement uh, of this uh, material that I think people should look at, and then 3SA2T6, and let me go back to this order now. Okay, so now we're in uh, uh, magnetic insulators. Uh, quantum paramagnets, and uh, we'll focus on bond randomness, uh, which we can think should be interesting to look at. It couples to spin singlet physics. Um, so it's going to couple to the thing that lets you build up entangled physics. It lives on a bond. Singlets live on a bond. Uh, okay, many people uh, have looked at this uh, for many interesting phases, especially spin liquid with a uh, large body of work uh, from Natasha Perkins, uh, one of the organizers. Uh, and uh, so here I want to uh, say, what can we say about families of phases? What, what can you get away with without specifying a Hamiltonian? Okay, so I still need to specify some families of phases. For example, uh, look at uh, valence bond solids by which I mean phases that preserve spin rotation, break some lattice symmetry, and add weak bond randomness. Okay, so in a 1D, uh, this is uh, well understood. Uh, if I have uh, spin piles or dimerized, uh, spontaneously dimerized uh, VBS phase in 1D, you can get in a J1, J2, but I'll leave the Hamiltonian arbitrary as long as it's within this phase. So H equals dot, dot, dot. Kind of borrowing, uh, Central often uses the Hamiltonian. Borrowing it. It's quite general, so we can borrow it here. <laughs> and uh, as when you have weak bond randomness, it couples to the domains. I get domain A, domain B, and I get domain walls, and the domain wall has to carry a spin one half. So then there is this active thing going on in the domain wall. It's a Kramer's doublet. It has to do something at low energy. Uh, it starts out gapless, generates some weak coupling to distant domain walls, and you end up with the random singlet phase, which is also understood in other ways. The, the one thing is random singlet phase. Um, and uh, one thing uh, uh, we figured out uh, a couple of years ago uh, is uh, in 2D, uh, though it's not obvious, actually a kind of similar result uh, still holds. Uh, so uh, this is a cartoon of some simplest uh, kind of dimer of VBS, but by VBS I mean any phase which spontaneously breaks lattice symmetry, preserving spin rotation. Okay, the domain walls can be trivial. But in addition to domain walls, there exists some point defect defined by the domain content around it. It's a kind of vortex which has to carry spin one half. That's really what defines it. And it nucleates at finite density for any weak, uh, arbitrarily weak bond randomness. And you can think of this vortex as a kind of relic of a spin on. Uh, and also, if you'd like talking about vortices, you should talk about homotopy. But here we need some discrete theory. So it's like some Z2 vortex, but it's some discrete version. Uh, and one crucial thing is to define this vortex to show it needs to carry spin one half. Um, the theory requires that before we add a disorder, we have an odd number of spin one half per unit cell. 
And we can still define it with this order. There's still an average to inflation symmetry, so I can still define an average to inflation unit cell. Um, and I can count, does my average translation unit cell have an odd number of spin one half? And I need that, and if I have that, then, uh, then I have this kind of vortex object. Okay, so that's uh, VBS uh, for weak disorder. Uh, you might also hope to make statements about uh, spin liquids, uh, which presumably are stable to, or to very weak disorder. Uh, and to really uh, say concrete things, you need to say what spin liquid are you talking about and what's the Hamiltonian. Uh, but uh, if we really want to get away with H equals dot, 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 we can say what if the disorder is stronger than all the quantum fluctuations of the singlets so that it's really just pinning classical dimers. And then we're talking about classical dimers with this order, and okay, that's something we can study. So you can study classical dimers uh, with this order, uh, and still imagine that, uh, that this order is weak compared to the spin gap before you added this order, which is the kind of cost of breaking a singlet. So I try to only have dimers, and now I try to make them live on uh, with uh, some disorder, so wh where they are is pinned by this order, and I try really hard to only have uh, dimers and make the spin gap very expensive, but nevertheless, uh, uh, we find that uh, for any delta over delta s, as long as you're in this, um, you nucleate a finite density of monomers, which are really spin one half. Okay, and it's a non-local effect, uh, uh, different from the non-local effect of the previous slide, but still some non-local effect, some kind of fractal rearrangement of the dimers. Uh, that needs to happen uh, and always happens even if the cost of a monomer is almost infinite. Okay, uh, and so uh, uh, both of these cases uh, uh, show some kind of related physics. In both cases, uh, you get a density of monomers, which are really uh, spin one half. Uh, and, and so there's two things I want to say briefly about it. Uh, uh, First, uh, phenomenology, and then second, some other kind of theory. Okay, but let's jump to phenomenology for a moment. So what are you going to get if you have this density of spin one half? Uh, you can imagine that like in 1D, they might, at least over some regime of RG flow, form uh, random singlets with long range singlets. You might also worry they form some triplets and larger spins, and indeed they will also form spin clusters, and you might get some very dilute spin glass uh, but putting that aside, uh, you will have some distribution of singlets, which uh, generically is going to look like power law, uh, the tail of the log normal distribution. Okay, so let's just assume this and run with it. And if you assume this and run with it, you can understand some experimental data. Uh, so this is uh, some of my favorite uh, data uh, in the quantum magnetism. I feel it's uh, Takagi's beautiful data on this hydrogen lithium iridate. You might expect some disorder from hydrogen. Um, and its heat capacity and temperature with different magnetic fields. Uh, zero field, it's some uh, square root heat capacity, but then uh, different magnetic fields, if you multiply it by square root B, multiply each curve by square root B, they all collapse uh, onto the same curve. Uh, and this particular data collapse and even this kind of scaling function can be explained if you run with the assumption of a power law distribution of random singlets, which you might think you need magnetic impurities to get, but actually you can get just with bond randomness. Okay, and this seems to occur in other materials like the 1TTS2, the molybdenate, and Herbert Smithite, like if you have just actual magnetic impurities, you seem to get this. Uh, but aside from the phenomenology, uh, something uh, especially that we're still thinking about, uh, I want to stress is how do you think of this theoretically? So, right, what, what was the statement if we have an odd number of spin one half per average unit cell, then when you have enough disorder to destroy either VBS symmetry breaking you started with or a spin liquid you started with, this takes infinitesimal disorder, this takes some finite amount. But once you destroy it, you trigger gapless spin excitations, these uh, spins that nucleate. So you started with some symmetry breaking or topological order, and you might have thought you could get rid of it by adding this order, uh, even weak bounded this order. You might get some trivial phase, but you don't. You get uh, these spin excitations, and uh, then you get these gapless excitations associated with them that could be long range, singlets. It's not Griffith's physics, uh, we can show clearly. 
Uh, so this smells like a Lipschultz-Mattis theorem, uh, Oshikawa's uh, kind of Lipschultz-Mattis theorem, um, because of this condition, but now with this order, because you only need the, the average unit cell. Uh, so in 2D, this result leads to a conjecture uh, that says, uh, okay, you should have LSM with bond disorder, and it's a little bit, it seems to be a little stronger in particular if you're avoiding symmetry breaking or, or topological order, you get a gapless spectrum that in particular has uh, spin excitations. So here we're relying on spins. We need, uh, we need uh, some spin uh, uh, U1 symmetry and uh, the time reversal. Uh, all that needs to be preserved exactly. Uh, and in 1D, my collaborator Adam Nahum was able to prove uh, a version of this that's actually even stronger that says this gapless spectrum really comes from some long range real space correlations uh, that are at least as long range as 1 over r squared. So there's this extra structure and really shows you it's not Griffith's physics, it's some long range correlations. And, um, um, uh, so there's things we're trying to do to understand this. Uh, 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 one approach, I won't really talk about it now, but you might hope to understand this by thinking of the spin one half as a surface of a spin one uh, SPT phase, like the spin half edge modes of uh, spin one Haldane chains, uh, and try to see uh, how much can you disorder the surface if you keep the bulk clean, how much can you disorder the surface and keep the anomaly that's going to give you an effective LSM theorem. Um, so we actually, I, we tried this, uh, uh, in a different context uh, uh, with Lee Radzikowski and others uh, for uh, uh, topological insulators of electrons, uh, and, uh, and it uh, seems to work only partially. Uh, uh, so this is a kind of general uh, thing one can ask about uh, LSM theorems, even with disorder, and to what extent you can understand them from topological thesis. But now let me put this uh, uh, aside. Uh, because I also want to tell you about uh, some other uh, uh, ongoing uh, unpublished work uh, that's uh, uh, with uh, uh, my PhD student, uh, Sami Hakani, who's here, and he has a nice poster uh, that also talks about this. Uh, the poster also talks about uh, this other uh, spin liquid candidate, uh, barium iridate, uh, which is a nice material and worth looking at on its own right. Uh, that kind of, even though it's a 2D magnet, it, it got us looking into uh, zigzag chains, uh, and uh, that's how we got into this uh, particular uh, project uh, that I want to tell you about now. Okay, and so this uh, project is going to be now this third kind of disorder, uh, crystalline topological defect. Okay, so uh, I'll show you this uh, toy model, this uh, kind of proof of concept, uh, simple model. Uh, which maybe also has some experimental connections, uh, but should be thought of as a proof of principle. So I'll specify the Hamiltonian this time. Okay, so just a, a Heisenberg antiferromagnetic chain, and maybe you can make it XXZ, and you can add some J2 if you want, uh, but something uh, in this phase of the, uh, the gapless uh, uh, beta Anza solution uh, of the uh, Heisenberg antiferromagnet in 1D. Okay, and that's the Hamiltonian. Uh, and now I'm going to draw the crystal structure, and I'm drawing it like this. Uh, and uh, it's a zigzag chain. We've seen zigzag chain spin chain the bunch uh, in in this uh, conference already. Uh, and uh, you might uh, wonder, like, why am I bothering to draw this crystal as a zigzag chain? The fact that this is coming from a zigzag chain, that fact does not enter the spin Hamilton. It's just uh, some J1, maybe J2 um, antiferromagnet. It doesn't care that this came from zigzagging. In particular, say there is a mirror symmetry here, so this diagonal and this diagonal must have the same J1. Um, doesn't care about this zigzagging. And so in particular, if I have this kind of zigzagging, I can also have two domains of the zigzagging, zigzag and zag-zig, and I would generically have some density of uh, domain walls, just crystal domain walls, and uh, this uh, zigzag, zag-zig domain wall also doesn't quite enter the spin Hamiltonian. At least it doesn't enter it as a domain wall. Maybe it makes this bond a little bit different, okay, and, uh, uh, we can work either in the limits where the bond is different or in the limits where it's not different. Uh, but it's, this, this, the domains and also the domain walls are almost invisible to the Hamiltonian. 
So I, I had the three categories of disorder, the kind of uh, really uh, uh, big effect of magnetic disorder on magnetic systems, and the milder, more subtle effect of bond randomness, which has a big effect on quantum paramagnets. Uh, and now, now I'm trying this uh, third kind of disorder, uh, and it almost looks too mild, you feel? Like it, it doesn't even enter the Hamiltonian for the spins. So can it do anything? Yeah. Yes. That's right, that's right. So indeed, making this bond, uh, this bond will be generically stronger or weaker in the spin Hamiltonian. That is a relevant perturbation. Uh, and uh, uh, what I'll tell you about works either in the limit uh, where it is, you really take it to be relevant and you look at large systems uh, and uh, you really cut off the chain, uh, or also in the limit, it could be, I could imagine some model you know, this bond might be a little shorter, so it might want to be stronger, but also the bond angle is different. Maybe there's competing effects that end up canceling each other out, and the magnitude of J on this bond might end up being exactly the same as the other ones. And even in that limit, I want to show you that there's still an effect here, okay? The effect will turn out to be basically the same, whether or not you, inc you include the relevant or originally relevant perturbation here. Okay, so it's an effect that I, I'm highlighting that comes out of something that's not in the Hamiltonian, whether or not there's also a local defect in the Hamiltonian here. Okay, so how could you hope at, at all hope to see some effect outside of the spin Hamiltonian? Well, one thing you could try is to add some electromagnetic fields, because if I have electric fields, they can tell the spatial positions of ions. Okay, but usually if I say I apply some electric field or I do some uh, linear response, we know linear response, I can compute expectation values of things that are just within the ground state, just within my state. I don't need to include the effect of the perturbation on modifying my state. Uh, so at least we cannot do linear susceptibility. That's not enough. Okay, and what we'll end up doing here, uh, and you can do other things, is uh, photon scattering. So uh, Raman scattering, the simplest kind, just Q equals zero, photon in, photon out. Okay, and the photons in principle have electric fields, so in principle they can see something here. Uh, and so part of the point is that when you do Raman, and the people who know about Raman know this uh, really well, right, you the photon polarization is defining some Raman operator, and it's the correlation function, the dynamical correlation function of this Raman operator that you're really measuring. This is the loudon flurry form uh, in the zigzag chains have been studied, also uh, by Brennig. Uh, and uh, what you end up getting, uh, because of uh, this coupling of the photon polarization to the spatial vectors between sites, like the vector between site R1 and uh, R2, R1 minus R2 uh, is this vector. Uh, so for example, if I put my photons polarized perpendicular to this diagonal bond, then the dot product vanishes for this bond and the Raman operator only includes this second diagonal bond, the even numbered bonds, these second diagonal bonds. Okay, but it turns out I don't need just this polarization. Uh, you get this effect generically for uh, various photon polarizations. It's strongest for crossed polarizations, EI perpendicular to ES. Um, uh, and so then the Raman operator almost looks like a dimerization operator. Right? It has some ex like explicit dimerization happening in this Raman operator. Uh, and then I have the two domains. Uh, something going on really at the domain wall. But also there's the difference between the two domains. That's gonna turn out to be the important thing, not the microscopic information here. Um, uh, yeah, and so we can, doesn't, it turns out not to matter much what we do for this bond either in R uh, and in H, though it's relevant, it will give a similar outcome uh, if we include it. So actually, I looked at this, and at first when we, uh, Sammy showed me this, I kind of squinted, and I thought, oh, it looks like a 1D VVS phase, and we know what I showed you earlier, right? The domain walls of 1D spin piles, the domain wall here looks like it should carry an extra spin. If this was really a Hamiltonian instead of a Raman operator, the domain wall between the two VBS domains would carry a spin. 
Uh, now, it's not a Hamiltonian, it's a Raman operator, so that doesn't quite work out. But nevertheless, it turns out that this defect is going to have a magnetic signature. Though it doesn't really carry a spin one half domain wall, but it still has a magnetic signature. Okay, so let me show you this now. Uh, and uh, to me, at least, this was really surprising. Uh, okay, so first, uh, this is some numerics uh, that Sami did. Uh, 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 DMRG to get the ground state, and then TBD for time evolution. And it's kind of ground state, and uh, just with this Raman operator, it's, it's low entanglement uh, 1D states. So it's pretty easy to do. Um, and you can see, uh, first I'll show you a zero magnetic field, then I'll add a magnetic field axis, really in the Hamiltonian. Okay, so first a zero field, uh, 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 in the blue curves here, between a clean and uh, with different domains, uh, I see that uh, this blue peak really is different at zero field. Okay, and then also when I have the zigzag domains, there is this response to magnetic fields that I didn't have before, but now when I have uh, disorder, when I have this, these domain walls, not only is the peak different, but it responds sharply to magnetic fields. Okay, so now this is Magneto Raman, uh, frequency of the uh, uh, Raman and magnetic field. Uh, and in the clean case, yeah, it's kind of gapless. And already that's a little uh, unusual. Raman is usually Q equals zero and uh, doesn't have intensity for the inelastic spectrum as you take frequency to zero. Uh, here it does because of the zigzagging. It's really kind of pi. Uh, but now it, it gets some gap because of the disorder, but then the gap closes and reopens in a magnetic field. Uh, and you can see this also uh, in mean field uh, and in bosonization. Uh, so this column is clean, this column is disorder with domain walls, uh, and uh, the same plots, uh, frequency, magnetic field, okay? And uh, so, uh, uh, across x, x, z from the mean field uh, x, y limit, where mean field is exact, uh, to the SE2 point, uh, which, uh, which has some other extra symmetry giving you a delta function, but generic x, x, z looks like this. Okay, so it's a lot of data, so kind of let, let's uh, walk through it. So for just a single domain without the defects, at zero field, you get this gapless response down to zero frequency with finite intensity inelastic response down to zero. And then you apply a magnetic field and you get a gap. Opening with field. But now when you have some finite density of domain walls, first at zero field, there's a gap associated with some typical density of the domain walls. And you say uh, finite density is two domain walls. Just two or is it finite density? Okay, so here these are plotted uh, to kind of compare with this. Uh, so uh, the same density of domain walls as here. Yeah, that's really what's meant. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for pointing it out. It's really, we mean the same density. So it's just some particular density of domain walls. Uh, and you get a gap associated with that density uh, with, with some factor of five uh, kind of so it, it gives you some uh, pi squared over two. So, so the gap is, is, is big uh, if the density is you know, every hundred or every thousand sites. You might hope to be able to see this kind of gap. Uh, and then when you apply a magnetic field, you do Magneto Raman, the gap closes and then reopens again. And you can see it in mean field. Mean field you might worry has artifacts, but it turns out that this physics is captured. Uh, actually, some pieces of it are, you need to go away from mean field. Uh, uh, but, uh, and you can see at least this basic feature even in mean field. Okay, so this uh, I think should be kind of surprising. You have this crystal defect. It doesn't even need to appear in the Hamiltonian. Nevertheless, when you have it, you get a response to magnetic fields. So zeroth order thing is that if you didn't know about this and you see magnetorama and something like this happening, uh, you might think, okay, you have some magnetic things going on here. Or actually, it's just a crystalline defect, some density of crystalline defects. Uh, why, why is it doing it? Uh, what is going on here? Uh, it's actually very simple to understand. So uh, this to me, it was surprising, but then uh, very simple. Um, so it's correct. 
Um, it's easy to see in the mean field limit, which captures at least some of this physics. Uh, just look at the, uh, do Jordan Wigner uh, fermionization, uh, fermion mean field. Uh, the fermions uh, just uh, fill some Fermi C. Um, and uh, uh, Raman, uh, to lowest order, just looks at the two particle density of states. And so it has a peak uh, at low frequencies uh, at 2KF. Uh, uh, and uh, 2KF is just pi if I have no magnetic field. And so my Raman, which is this dimerized alternating operator, it's effectively probing pi. That's why it's giving me a zero frequency uh, response. In elastic response here, it's really just seeing this 2KF. Okay, but now when I add some density of defects, uh, it's effectively shifting the wave vector that Raman sees, and now it's going to be away from pi, so it's going to be somewhere here, and it sees some effective gap. Even though the system is gapless, it sees some effective gap. But now as I add a magnetic field, the magnetic field is a chemical potential of the fermions. It shifts 2KF, and as 2KF shifts across my uh, 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 delta Q of the defect density, uh, it becomes gapless and then gaps out again. Okay, and uh, to see this, uh, this is uh, low frequency uh, physics, uh, but it does help, usually it's hard to see low frequency. Uh, the resolution is also hampered by the fact that the signal goes to zero at zero frequency at Q equals zero. Uh, but here, the magnitude, the intensity, doesn't go to zero. That omega goes to zero, the inelastic intensity. Uh, so you should be able to see it. Uh, good, and, uh, and I'm uh, almost done. Uh, uh, and so uh, another thing I want to stress is that this is really coming from the topological nature of this uh, domain wall. Okay, there's also some local defect going on, uh, but that's not the story. So for example, you can just put two defects next to each other, double your density of defects, but always have them come in pairs next to each other. Uh, and that's this uh, green curve, double domain wall. And you see it's exactly as if you had no defects at all. Okay, so having these domain walls, they really have some Z2 character. It's really the domain wall physics that's coming here. And so it's very different from the usual way Raman sees defects, which of course usually come in the Hamiltonian. Defects might give you some uh, localized state, which gives some broad feature in Raman, uh, or defects uh, might break a symmetry and break a selection rule uh, and allow you to see some new feature in Raman. Uh, but, but this is very different, uh, these uh, uh, Z2 uh, domain walls. In particular, instead of get, getting an, an ad, ad, like the usual defect free thing plus some delta intensity associated with the magnitude of the disorder, Instead of getting that, you shift the entire intensity plot somewhere else. So if I look at the intensity, what's my additive change? It's order one. It's not order delta. Okay, the, the change, like the shift in frequency is order delta. But the additive shift of intensity is order one. You cannot get this with local defects. And it's because it's really this uh, domain wall, the kind of topological defect. And associated with that is the fact that the contributions from each domain individually have perfect destructive interference, as long as I have an average symmetry that says there's an equal number of the two domains, which in, in, I should generically have in a big system, equal number of zigzag and zag-zag domains, and this is what gives this uh, perfect order one change, destroying my clean peak and giving me a new peak uh, because of the disorder. Okay, so this is a very uh, uh, different uh, effect uh, of this order uh, uh, that uh, I hope I convinced you with this kind of toy model proof of principle uh, can arise, uh, and uh, 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 it's a kind of uh, disorder within a response theory, uh, uh, and especially uh, when you have uh, here domain walls uh, uh, giving it, uh, it's kind of different. Uh, so it's domain walls, lattice domain walls giving a magnetic signature, is one surprise. And it's also, it's defects within a response theory. And to get all this physics, I needed to have this uh, uh, Fermi uh, liquid, Luttinger liquid phase of the fermionic spin-ons, it's really a probe 
to get this physics is really a probe of having uh, spin-ons in this 1D system. Uh, so you could hope to generalize it, and uh, we're working on this, to 2D and 3D spin liquids uh, and use this as uh, this qualitative probe, this non-monotonicity magnetic field uh, probe uh, of uh, spin liquids. Uh, and maybe there's other ways uh, to have this order couple not just to the Hamiltonian, but also to your probes in a way that's not captured within linear response. Uh, it's really this other thing going on here that this order is appearing uh, within the response theory operator and, and thereby giving you a very different kind of response that you might not have expected. And I'll finish there. Thanks. Great questions. Thank you, Itamar. Uh, uh, maybe to add to collection of your classification of, uh, of uh, defects or maybe across some boundaries. There was an early discussion in this uh, program by uh, uh, Thomas Voita, which unfortunately wasn't recorded, I think, um, mainly reporting on uh, the works of his brother uh, about uh, uh, what you define as benign and non-magnetic effect of uh, defects which can be considered benign like bond disorder, in frustrated, simple frustrated, completely isotropic magnets, uh, which due to the fact that interactions are frustrated, you locally violate the balance in the ordered systems between the uh, established order and thus generate an uh, extended defect, which, is, uh, which has some names, uh, textures and some others, which can, in principle, be of very strong dipolar order in terms of how it's relevant. So again, this is an example of non-magnetic impurity inducing you uh, rather drastic disorder. And the other thing which I think transpired maybe on the, on the, on the background of that uh, same discussion is that when you start having, like in YMGO, which you quote here, you start having an isotropic exchange matrix. Same benign form of disorder induces you what can be considered as transverse field attack, which is again a very strong disorder. Again, coming from weak impurities, you get strong disorder. Thank you for the comment. Yeah, and uh, uh, right, and, uh, and I know well your work on, uh, on YMGO. Uh, I'm also thinking of some of your work, actually, but right. So, Right, and so here, there is a big effect here with frustration, and okay, I was focusing on the big effect with frustration uh, when you have uh, enough frustration to get the response, but you're pointing out, uh, indeed, also in magnetic order, you can get uh, uh, big effects that completely change the phase from non-magnetic randomness, even within magnetic order, uh, especially with anisotropy, and uh, okay, I should learn about the Voita uh, things with the uh, uh, extended defects, uh, yeah. Thank you for the comment, I, I completely agree, that's right. So thank you. Um, would you venture also, including a Hamiltonian, uh, try to give a little more detail what you think about the 2 or 3D scenario? What do you want to do with the Raman? With the Raman? Yeah. Uh, so. I, let me not talk about the 2D and 3D uh, yet. Uh, but okay. uh, the natural, I mean, the most uh, natural extension is to spin on Fermi surface phase. Right. And then I, I ref I'm not going to give a microscopic Hamiltonian. Okay. Uh, but I can give an effective Hamiltonian. Okay. That's right. Thank you. So, uh, Itamar. Um, so, the, I, I guess the, 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 the point is that, that on this one bond, you introduce a new direction. And this new direction, that couples to the polarization uh, of the Raman operators, right? That that's where the the frog jumps into the water, so to say. That's the, mm -hmm. that's the point. Um, so I, I guess one could also do that in high, other higher order uh, spectroscopies. Yes. So, for instance, resonance in, elect in elastic X-ray scattering um, would exactly Absolutely. work that way. That you need to have an incoming polarization and outgoing polarization. And wherever you have a bond that does not respect the other bonds in, in, in terms of direction Absolutely. Or, or any other and equivalents for that matter, you, you will get a, a signature from that. So then I have a question. So you mentioned that the um, you have an order one effect. 
So the order one is because you have destructive inf interference of the other two, uh, of the zigz zigzag and the zigzag uh, portions. Is, is that correct? Yeah, so let me write, let me say, there's different ways of thinking about it. So the Raman operator is gonna be, for a single domain, it looks like this. And now when I have multiple domains, it's like this for this domain, plus, sorry, with a minus sign for this domain. Like, let me call it RA for the A domain, plus RB for the B domain. And now I compute the dynamical correlation function of the product of R. So I have direct terms, RA, RA, and the cross terms, RA, RB. Uh, and these give perfect destructive interference uh, for what I had previously had, the RA, RA, like, intra-domain cancels out, and instead I, I get this other effect coming from the cross term, uh, which is how I shift everything. Right. Which is maybe very, or a particular situation, that's not the generic case. Or no, no, but, but, like that. but I want to say as long as I have an equal number of A and B domains, then in, in this model, but if you go to two dimensions or three dimensions or more general settings, then there will in general not be this uh, destructive interference. So yes, yeah, so, right. So here that's what, to get the destructive interference, that's part of, uh, among other things, w the reason this needs to be like a domain wall or a dislocation, a topological defect uh, uh, that um, has two different things on either side with equal probability. Yeah, uh, thanks for very interesting talk. So uh, again, my question about the same uh, 1D Raman. So yeah, I roughly understood that uh, by introducing domain wall, this Raman scattering, which usually picks up a Q equals to pi uh, structure factor, but uh, by considering these uh, domain walls, you effectively shift the wave number uh, from pi to probe. Yes. But uh, then, uh, do we have the uh, same effect if it's not really disorder, but a uh, periodic array of uh, same defect? Yes, yeah. So uh, indeed, like a, a periodic array of this uh, domain wall. So yeah. yeah. So indeed, actually, to, to draw these plots with like a very sharp yeah. is imagining the same distance between mm -hmm. domain walls, which is a little artificial. You'll have maybe some Gaussian distribution of so, domain so sizes, and it'll give some Gaussian smear. Disorder, it's a little bit broader. Disorder will will smear these plots okay. a little. Okay. That's right. Makes sense. Thank you. But there will still, I mean, having a gap uh, that that. Will be preserved. So we soft gap. Yes. Say it again. Calculated for one D. Yes. So this is all within this one D toy model. That's right. The kind of proof of principle. Yeah. Uh, so two questions. One first. Uh, this is a little bit related to what Jeroen was asking. Uh, can you make a general statement about the kinds of probes that you will be sensitive to, and uh, you know where this physics would kind of show up? So Raman and Ricks, but these are relatives. Is there is there a more general statement? Well, about? anything with photons. So, and, and the moment you have electric fields, your electric field when you have electric dipole coupling. Um, uh -huh. Any second order. Yeah. Any second order response. Any second order response. Right. So it probably doesn't show up in optical conductivity, I would guess, for instance. Okay. So, I, so I won't be able to fully answer your question. I would like to discuss more. I think there is some. So also, like often we talk about linear response and nonlinear, and nonlinear can mean so many different things. So you can just do expansions. I can do linear susceptibility, second and third order susceptibilities, but that, that may not quite be enough, I think. The scattering is really not, it's a different animal because it comes, it lets you compute this operator, not just applying third order electric fields. Uh, so the scattering is different, um, and I think that's important here. Okay. The, the second question is, uh, so by, you have, by construction here, yeah. as you, you say, it doesn't, this defect doesn't enter in the Hamiltonian, but it's the, 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 the probe is sensitive to it. Is this ultimately going to be, is this a, a realistic perspective on what disorder might actually do? I mean, do we have any hope to find a system where you might actually look for this? Or any defect is going to have, you know, maybe this, but then, you know, it's going to have a short bond, long bond, no bond. Okay, certainly, so lo local defects in general, the domain walls will also function as a local defect, which will generically enter the Hamiltonian. 
very generically in any dimension right. will give you some localized state and some broad feature on top of what's discussed mm -hmm. here. In 1D, it's RG relevant and cuts open the chains, but actually then you get some kind of finite size effects that are somewhat related to this. Um, so I think this is realistic. The bottleneck is probably uh, like uh, this is low frequency physics. Uh, and so to what extent could, can you have enough low frequency resolution? Uh, maybe the bottleneck. So, so I have, so I have two, well, two related questions. The first question, if you now do the real calculation, you, you say that what is the gap probably just gets is an exponential tail or something like that, or? Yeah, we, with some uh, distribution of uh, uh, things, there, like there is a, the density of states doesn't exactly go to zero here, but it goes yeah, probably exponentially down to zero. Uh, and, and this mm -hmm. gets smeared a little bit over some region. And, and my, my real question was is a little bit about the intuition. So, yes. so one, one way to get intuition, what an operator is doing, especially a relevant one, is you switch on a finite operator of that sort, yeah? So when you go to omega to zero, it's kind of taking the limit of a static perturbation, yeah? And for the static perturbation, we know what it does. Namely, it gives you, the, it opens a gap in the between, yeah? And then it gives you these localized spins on the defects, yeah? And when you add a finite R operator to your Hamiltonian. So I, I'm kind of surprised that the phase which rebuilds the low energies, that an operator which rebuilds the low energy spectrum so completely doesn't, at, at omega equals zero, doesn't have a response for omega to zero. And I was wanted to ask whether you have some intuition how that can be. Yeah, very good question. So I think I understand what you're saying. You're saying, okay, and going back, I can think of scattering as a linear response of coupling to the coupling the system to this Raman operator. Scattering is a kind of linear response to this particular operator constructed with the photon polarizations. Then you're saying, now I, let me add it to my Hamiltonian. Once it's in the Hamiltonian, this is like add for actual VBS in 1D, domains, domain A, domain B, and the domain wall carries a spin one half, uh, which, which totally closes the spin gap immediately. And I, uh, so I think I understand your question, uh, if I understood it correctly. Uh, and uh, now that I understood it, I don't have an answer. That's a great question. Uh, yeah, yeah, very, uh, yeah, nice perspective. Uh, we should talk about it. Just, just a small question, maybe I missed it. What are the units of frequency? Uh, J equals, I said uh, there. J, okay. J equals one, yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. The, the okay. exchange equals one. Uh -huh. yeah. Thank you. So, well, a naive question might be a misassumption. In a, without the defect, Raman operator commutes with Hamiltonian. If I just take the J1 Heisenberg model okay. and then uh, Raman is only, only has a chance to be J1 Heisenberg, that's correct. Yeah. In your calculation, which model is? So, in, in those plots that you're showing, this are just nearest neighbor Heisenberg. That's right. It's only nearest neighbor. Uh, it's XXZ for the particular things. Uh, the Raman operator, okay, within bosonization, it's really only the XX part anyway. Actually, uh, within the exact calculation, Raman operator is Heisenberg, and this is Heisenberg, both are Heisenberg. So indeed, it is just J1 Heisenberg, Heisenberg Raman. Right. And as you point out, the only term in Raman which does not commute in the, with the Hamiltonian is this alternating term. Exactly. Yes. Okay. And so, so, I mean, which I think somewhat helps to understand why this defect is of order one effect because no no I, I, I think that's not enough because we're comparing I already have the domains so our a is always there uh, maybe it's enough probably what you're saying is correct but let me try to uh, understand it and just say what it is so without the defect just a single domain my Raman operator is pure RA. With defects, my Raman operator is a sum of some RAs and some RBs. But if I just had local defects, I could still say the Raman operator is like RA plus some thing with local defects. It's because I can get the destructive interference between a, with RA cross term RB destroying the term that would come purely from RA and purely from RB, 
that's what reduces to zero the original Raman peak and creates from scratch this new Raman peak. And, and maybe that's what you're saying, actually. Are there other questions? Uh, are you doing the calculation in finite size system or are you trying to do the calculation uh, in the thermodynamic limit? Uh, this is finite size with 80 sides, mm -hmm. and bosonization is thermodynamic. Just, yeah, you pointed out correctly, it's just with a, uh, a, a wave vector associated with a defect density that's the same as this wave vector, but it's just some, but the calculation is thermodynamic limit. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, if there are no other, oh, uh, okay. If there are no other questions, let's thank the speaker again.